All right. All right well, welcome everybody. Um, so now my name is Joe Agavino. I am uh, uh, Senator Brooks's communications director. I am also also have the privilege of overseeing uh, the senator's internship program. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, we started um, reaching out for uh, to different areas uh, for an, basically a virtual internship program where we involved issues, uh, you know, areas like research, policy analysis, communications, different things along those lines. And it worked so well that we decided um, to extend it in this new year. And what we did was we reached out to academic programs across the country and really were uh, overwhelmed with such an amazing response of uh, students uh, that we basically, uh, students and, and just great, you know, like incredible academics uh, that we opted to do to set up some research uh, programs that uh, today is one of them, obviously uh, the one of the uh, big concerns for Senator Brooks is uh, veterans and uh, veteran suicide, the high rates of veteran suicides. And that, uh, you know, obviously a lot going on with that. So we put together a star team of uh, academic students, both undergraduate and graduate students who uh, did a four month long research project, put together a report with, um, with analyses, recommendations, uh, and uh, just an overall view. And we are really grateful that you joined us here today, the Veterans Council of the State of New York, various members of the veterans community. Um, right now, I am going to uh, just pass it over to Senator Brick so he can welcome you all and you know, say a few words. Thank you, Joe, and good afternoon, everybody. And, um, you know, um, as an old guy, um, we look at the world that we created and that we're in short time going to hand over to the younger folks of today. And we certainly could have done a better job. But the younger generation that we have in the nation today has really, I think, showed real leadership at a number of uh, times in our country. Most notably, I think we look back to the tragic events in Florida uh, with a shooting incident down there. And, and the young students from that school took the country by storm and really made gun safety a major issue. I had an opportunity to talk to a number of them over the time and um, you know you try to think about what they went through and uh, I spoke with the one girl talking about she was running across the field talking to her mom kind of telling her what's going on and saying goodbye at the same time and and after the dust settles if you will from the event they led a nationwide effort that resulted in in uh, in many states, important gun control work. And they showed leadership. My generation, way back when in the 1800s, but actually during the Vietnam War, uh, was a generation that, that spoke out too for change. Um, but um, probably not, not as efficiently and professionally as this generation did. So, um, in, in last year's election, we, we put together a group to work on a campaign that never materialized because we ended up without an opponent, but had an opportunity to work on issues, work with people in other campaigns, and, and they showed the wisdom they have, the wisdom they have at a young age. And uh, what we did um, post the election and everything else, as Joe said, is got a group of these people together and have given them the opportunity uh, to address some of the issues that we face as a nation and, and give us what they think we should be done. They worked under the, uh, the tutorship, I guess we'll say, of Brianna and Trent to, to keep them going through these activities. And today, um, they're going to present some ideas uh, on a very critical issue. Um, one that uh, just continues to to bring pain to all those involved and and that, that is the suicide rates that we see within some of the military people so i look forward to uh 
to uh, hearing what they have to say. We have, uh, I, I have the honor of chairing the Veterans Committee up in Albany. Uh, one of our uh, committee members is also uh, with us today. I'm gonna have Elijah uh, um, say a few remarks and then uh, we're gonna get to uh, an opportunity to listen to the next generation tell us to, how we might be able to fix some of the problems that we haven't been able to resolve today. So Elijah, would you like to say something? Thank you so much, uh, Chair Brooks. It is great to be here. I'm Senator Elijah Reichland Melnick, proud to represent the 38th District in New York and to be a member of the Veterans Committee. Um, this is my first year in the Senate and it has been a wonderful experience serving with this committee. Um, the chairman is, is so committed to our veterans and to trying to improve, just you know, improve the services that we as a state to provide to those who have served the country. And uh, it, it, is, it is an honor to be part of this. And I'm excited to hear um, what, the, what all of you have come up with, because I think that this issue of veteran suicide is one we have got to get a better handle on. Um, people are, are taking their lives at such an alarming rate. And you know these are, these are some of our heroes and we should be doing whatever we possibly can as a state government and as a society to help them get the services and the treatment and the support that they need um, to make sure that they are in a good place and never get driven to this extreme. Um, I'm gonna be able to stay for a few minutes today, uh, only on the Zoom, unfortunately, but I'm really looking forward to reading the uh, recommendations as well. So I wanna thank you for what you did and, and you know, happy to be here. Senator, uh, could we introduce uh, uh, ourselves, at least uh, from the council perspective, and there's some people here that uh, I don't recognize and would uh, like to know so that we can interact properly uh, from the council's perspective. I'm the legislative advocate and, and center uh, uh, above Maria Morrison is uh, Bob Becker, who's the president of the council. And uh, Linda McInnes, uh, right underneath Senator Brooks on my screen uh, is uh, the vice president of the council. Hi, Linda. And who has been very active in veteran suicide for since I've known her, which is like eight years now. Uh, Ashton Stewart, also very, very active, uh, and uh, specifically with SAGE and, uh, and the uh, representation of LGBT veterans uh, within the council, uh, but on many other issues as well. Um, and, I, I, um, I, I, and Floyd Hunt, uh, uh, sorry, Floyd, a longtime member of the council, uh, uh, underneath uh, Joe uh, Agovino. And, uh, but then the rest of the folks, uh, well, excuse me, um, Adrian uh, uh, Rivera, you are with the assembly, right? No, I am not actually. I am a member of the intern team. Ad Adrian oh, is actually, no. Adrian is, is actually the, uh, the team leader uh, yeah. uh, for the project. But however, we do expect her to be representing us in some way, shape or form at some point. And so, there is um, Bill well, in this presentation you on, Rivera, but that is not me. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't mistake you. Uh, uh, I thought, however, that you were on a previous a Zoom meeting that we had, no? Yeah, she was. As, are, you a, are you a staffer? Uh, well, anyway, okay, so you, <laughs> you, you folks know who we are. Um, maybe you could all introduce yourselves uh, as well. Uh, Kirby, I'll just uh, simply say that uh, Adriana is a part of the research team. She's an MPA student at Penn State right now, and uh, she will be. Um, again, we, we are looking to, uh, for all these all, all these uh, researchers and interns that are involved. Uh, we expect them. We are very excited to see where their futures are going to be. Um, is there anyone else that would like to uh, that has not been um, mentioned that has not been introduced and would like to introduce themselves at this point? Yeah, yeah, I would like. My name is Mike Matthews. I'm a director of uh, veterans programs at the Staten Island uh, PPS. Uh, by the way, Paul Dietrich got me hooked up with you guys. And, good, Paul's a good man. And um, the reason that I'm joining is we here at the Staten Island PPS are developing a suicide prevention pilot, collaborating with the, Depart the New York City Department of Veteran Services. And we're developing this on Staten Island with the idea of ex hopefully expanding the pilot to other boroughs. So clearly this is something that I'm extremely interested in and I'm very happy and eager to hear what, what um, uh, is, is, is said at the meeting today. Terrific. That's that's wonderful. Uh, thank you for joining us. 
<laughs> so I guess I don't have to introduce Kirby to uh, introduce everybody. Well, no, so I guess never been here. we're ready to go. All right, I think we'll be, yeah, I think we're ready to go. Anyone else want to need to um, uh, have that has not been introduced? Hi. I'm Bob Becker, that means anything. No, <laughs> say that again. Okay. Uh, uh, so I was just say hi. Um, my name is Haley. I am from Senator Daphne Jordan's office. Uh, Senator Jordan sits on the Senate Veterans Committee. So um, I am here to listen to the presentation and I am excited to hear what you guys have to say. So thank you so uh, much for setting this up. Haley, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. And please thank the Senator for uh, sending uh, representation. I'll just let you know that we are we will be supplying the, the written report to everybody as well as um, a, a recorded version of this presentation. So uh, Senator Reichland Melnick, I wanna thank you again for joining us. Um, and uh, same thing I wanted to say to you, we'll have a, a, a complete uh, recorded version that you can review later on. Uh, I know that you have a, a, <coughs> some other important meetings coming up. So um, right now it is my pleasure to throw, the, uh, throw everything over to our uh, project leader, that is Adriana Rivera. Thank you, Joe. I will go ahead and start sharing screen. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us here today. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself and my colleagues. As you've just heard, my name is Adriana, and the past few months, I've led the Veteran Suicide Policy Team in developing a research strategy and policy recommendations in relation to the topic. In total, there were 14 policy interns from Senator John Brooks office that participated in this project. But for the purposes of the presentation, my colleagues, Amanda, Michelle, and Jamie, who served as the team leaders throughout the presentation will be joining me and explaining some of the policy recommendations that came from our research throughout this project. On this slide, you will see a list of all of the team members that participated in research and conducting other research and promoting policy recommendations and some of which you will see throughout this presentation. And today we're going to discuss, of course, veteran suicide and how the New York State Legislature can better mitigate and prevent the issue. Veteran suicide is a complex issue, complex issue excuse me, that encompasses a variety of topics and experiences that can be hard to understand if you've never served in the military or have not been exposed to the veteran community. The first thing I wanted to do when approaching this topic was identify the overarching questions that needed to be answered in order to present full solutions to veteran suicide, some of which you can see on the slide here. So what are the primary factors that contribute to veteran suicide? While there are a variety of factors and social scenarios that play a role in contributing to suicide ideation, I found that the three largest issues in relation to veteran suicide somehow worked under the umbrella of infrastructure and accessibility, mental health, and women veteran health. Under these three sectors, it became very clear that there are a lot of veterans who do not and are not able to access the necessary resources that could improve their quality of life and hopefully decrease the likelihood of them committing suicide. We wanted to identify what veterans were being left behind in the current VA and veteran resource system. This includes veterans who have received an other than honorable discharge, which in most cases disqualifies them from accessing VA resources, women veterans who opt out of using the VA at a much higher rate than their male counterparts, and veterans who do not go through the VA disability rating process to identify any mental and or physical health conditions that would allow them to access VA benefits. Today, there are over half a million veterans who have received an other than honorable or OTH discharge nationally, which is half a million veterans who have not been able to access any VA services. Veterans with an OTH discharge have shown higher rates of PTSD, have more difficulty with employment, healthcare, housing, finances, and are more likely to become homeless, yet they have been the least resourced sector of the veteran community. Nationally, only 17% of women veterans use VA services, but in the 17%, 50% of the women have a service-connected disability. So you see a high need met with a low usage rate in terms of veteran services. In 2017, it was found that on average, 17 veterans committed suicide on a daily basis, and out of this group, 62% of the victims had not used any veteran health services within the few years leading up to their death. 
So the majority of veterans who commit suicide either do not have access or do not use VA resources, which is why resource availability for veterans is so important. Lastly, we wanted to find out what problems existed in the current veteran and suicide literature and infrastructure, and if they can be repaired, how we can go about doing so, which will be discussed throughout this presentation. These questions led us to a quality of life and public health approach to addressing suicide, which has been identified as one of the best ways to mitigate suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention, both in the civilian and veteran communities. So where does the problem begin? The rapid increase in veteran suicide can be traced back to 9-11 since Operation Iraqi Freedom began. We have seen an increase in deployments and levels of stress in the military branches, which have all played a role in the increase. For instance, New York veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan have reported facing a variety of challenges once they return home, including stress and mental health conditions, social isolation, confusion about their benefits and how to access services, difficulty finding employment and funding education. In conjunction with 9-11 is military recruitment, which also began to increase in the years following 9-11. With recruitment of high school students or majority teenagers to join the military comes the danger of the adverse health outcomes as a result of military service. Veterans between the ages of 18 and 34 have seen their suicide rates double in the past decade, specifically in New York. But this trend has continued nationally as well. It's been shown in various studies that the youngest service members consistently show the worst health effects of military service, ranging from PTSD, MST or military sexual trauma, anxiety conditions, substance use, dep and depression. One of the most consistent issues we've also seen has to do with better integrating veterans into the VA system, which can be traced to the transition assistance program. All active duty service members are required to complete a transition assistance program with their local ver veteran service officer or VSO within 90 days of their departure date from the military. But in many cases, veterans do not return home to the city or state where they initially enlisted in the military, nor do, do they stay in the location where they're exiting the military. So there's been a problem with identifying and tracking all of the veterans who leave the military and ensuring they are aware and connected to VA resources and if necessary are able to complete the VA disability rating process. The last major part of our preliminary research was identifying the high risk characteristics associated with veteran suicide. What we found is mental health conditions, economic disparities, homelessness, service-connected disabilities or trauma, and social isolation have all played a role in contributing to suicide ideation in veterans. This list also emphasizes the necessity for a public health approach to addressing veteran suicide. So how can we resolve some of the initial issues veterans face? As mentioned in the previous slides, veterans who receive an other than honorable discharge as a result of their military service tend to face increased difficulty in navigating civilian life. Veterans with this type of discharge face social isolation, alienation from military support resources, and have a much higher risk of suicidality. This is an equity and access problem that seems to disproportionately affect the younger and lower educated population. <clears throat> Recent research has shown that the older and more educated an active duty member is, the less likely they are to receive an OTH discharge. Whether the direct cause is maturity, bias, or a combination of both, our young veterans need support that is not currently being offered by the Department of Veterans Affairs. We can help resolve this by giving more veterans access to VA resources, especially if their other than honorable discharge was given due to a nonviolent offense. From 2011 to 2015, 62% of recently separated service members received a mental health diagnosis that was present within two years of the mil their military career ending. This tells us that not only are young and low educated population groups being given less resources, but service members who may have had a service connected mental health condition are being given an other than honorable discharge, which in many cases is not reevaluated or changed after the fact. The Restoration of Honor Bill, which was recently signed here in New York, requires the Department of Veterans Affairs, excuse me, <clears throat> to review other than honorable discharge cases of veterans who have been diagnosed with PTSD or TBI, traumatic brain injury, as well as any LGBTQ members who may have been given an other than honorable charge because they were openly gay in the military before the don't ask, don't tell policy was eradicated. 
This bill takes a critical first step at reevaluating the true causes of an OTH discharge, which, which can greatly decrease the suicidality of veterans who feel left behind. However, this is the first bill of its kind introduced in the nation, and there are still hundreds of thousands of veterans who need the same access and resource availability as veterans without an OTH discharge. The next issue that needs to be addressed is the transition process for veterans. VA research has shown that the first year following a military separation can pose many transition related challenges for veterans. This can range from homelessness, family reintegration, employment, mental health conditions, substance use, all of which, we can, which can increase the risk <laughs> of suicide. To resolve some of these issues I've previously mentioned, there needs to be a system created to track and reach out to veterans who have recently started the transition process from military to civilian life. This could require veteran service officers or other VA employees to have a year long check in period with all veterans. Ideally, all the veteran um, ideally, the Veteran Transition Assistance Program that all active duty members have to participate in, these veterans can be given an intake form that would document the veteran's new location once they leave their current station and automatically enroll them to receive notifications and alerts from the VA hospital nearest to them. Within six weeks of the veteran's exit date from the military, someone from the VA, either the VSO or another certified clinician, could reach out to the veteran, check in with them, and see if they begun or completed the disability rating process to get any potential disabilities from military service evaluated. This could also take place in the form of a transition buddy or someone who works with veterans for the first year of their transition process to ensure them and their family get their feet off the ground and settle into their new lifestyle properly. We can further motivate and promote the VA disability process with veterans by incentivizing education. For instance, in California, there's the Veteran Tuition Fee Waiver, which pays for all public university degrees for the dependents and spouses of veterans. This includes two four-year universities and graduate programs. Studies have shown that difficulties paying for education and other daily stressors that occur in a veteran's life can contribute to stress that may end up leading to a high risk factor associated with suicide. Lastly, Executive Order 13822 was signed to create new pathways to, to connect veterans in transition from active duty to a civilian lifestyle. And it encompasses some of the recommendations I have just gone through to help veterans transition more smoothly into civilian life. Specifically with this order, veterans will be able to learn about VA benefits and start the application process for enrollment before they leave the military. And they, will also, they could also be assigned to a qualified mental health clinician who would identify any mental health conditions the veteran may have and provide them with the necessary resources. To date, this program has not been fully implemented in the state of New York, although the executive order was signed in 2018, and it could be a critical part of better identifying any high risk factors associated with suicide in the veteran population. In the following slides, we will continue to propose policy recommendations associated with high risk factors of suicide. Before diving into what policies could potentially be introduced, we first mm -hmm. needed to look at what was already present. One of the biggest areas of focus was that of existing programs intended to assist veterans in their efforts to obtain medical attention related to mental health concerns. We also recognize outside factors that directly relate to the presence of these mental health conditions. It was crucial for us to look into the quality and accessibility of the programs that are already in place in order for us to determine what more can be done. So for the sake of infrastructure and accessibility, we looked at mental health screening, telehealth, the welfare state and VA hospital funding. Next. At the start of our research on veteran suicide, we noticed that the literature did not address one topic, the military recruitment process. Mental health conditions don't always begin after service, often occurring very early on in one's military experience. And while health screenings are done prior to entrance into the military, these do not always take into consideration the mental health state of each individual. This can prove to be detrimental as the individual would not necessarily be receiving care for any potential mental health concern and certain aspects of serving have a strong possibility of worsening what may already be present. We looked into the recruitment process with regards to military recruiters at high schools, as well as ROTC programs uh, available at universities and the demands that come with such programs. 
A caveat of Section 9528 of the No Child Left Behind Act from 2001 allows for personal information of high school students to be accessed upon request by military recruiters. Keep in mind that the students being addressed here are between the ages of 14 and 18. Now, as the chart shows, and as I'll discuss a bit more, it's the younger service members who are more likely to commit suicide. VA data showed that the suicide rate of veterans aged 18 to 34 rapidly increased from 2005 to 2018, with a jump of more than 10% from 2015 to 2016. This translates roughly into 45 deaths per 100,000 veterans, being the highest of any age group. Veterans in this age group also tend to have the highest mental health diagnosis rates for military service. Now, upon supplying a group of ROTC students from Roger Williams University with a veteran mental health related survey, I came to understand that these individuals do not have a full understanding of veteran mental health conditions. Given that this group falls within the age range of veterans who are more likely to commit suicide, I felt it was important to address these issues. The truth is recruiters aren't always 100% transparent with when it comes to explaining the military experience to potential recruits. The benefits and perks of joining the military are always prioritized over the truth that serving has the potential to cause or worsen many mental illnesses. Honesty is the best way for recruits to truly know what they're getting involved with, and then they should make the decision whether or not to join after hearing the pros and cons of serving, not just what benefits they might potentially receive. Next. Now going into deeper aspects of infrastructure and accessibility, we have mental health screening, telehealth, and the welfare state. Now, at the, as of this moment, there's only one available test related to assessing mental health of veterans, which is the Defense Health Agency's military health system. The DAJ 4 and 5 are screenings completed 181 days to 18 months after return from deployment and 18 months to 30 months after return from deployment, respectively. These assessments evaluate the physical health of the individual, which, while very important, should not overshadow the importance of evaluating mental health. The information collected regarding mental health matters, if any is collected, does not take into consideration the possibility of these concerns being present prior to service or having been developed very early on, which as the data shows, is increasingly common. With regard to telehealth, one of the biggest concerns throughout the state is the fact that not all areas in New York receive the same type of funding for veteran medical facilities. Telehealth has proven to be extremely useful as a source for medical attention during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, but equal access to such resources is not present throughout the state. Particularly in rural areas throughout New York State, access to broadband is a significant impediment to accessing appropriate healthcare services. Additionally, urban veterans face longer wait times for in-person appointments. From October 2019 to June 2020, there was an average reported wait time of 41.9 days. Now, 71% of suicide survivors stated that they mm -hmm. attempted to take their life within an hour of making the decision. 24% of survivors said the attempt was made within five minutes. We also looked closely at the welfare state, as there are plenty of factors outside of those related to military service that have a direct impact on an individual's mental health. Such factors include homelessness and food and financial insecurities. For example, according to the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, as of 2017, there were approximately 40,000 veterans that experienced homelessness on any given day. As for food insecurity, the concern of where one's next meal is going to come from has been proven to have a severe detrimental impact on one's mental health. Next. Now I'd like to get into some of the policy proposals of this section. To start, it was our contention that there must be some type of health assessment that was dedicated to evaluating the mental health of military personnel at all levels, meaning ROTC students, active duty military personnel, and retired veterans. And while this may seem like a lot, it would be the most effective way to ensure that any mental health matters are found and addressed as soon as possible. This is why we have come up with a bi-monthly required mental health assessment created by licensed professionals that will ask targeted questions regarding the mental state of the individual. The frequency of this assessment, which for clarification would be every two months, will provide consistent tracking of each service member's mental state and allow any necessary treatment to be provided as soon as possible. With regard to telehealth, we encourage New York State lawmakers to advocate for the federal government to invest in New York State VA healthcare systems through multiple telehealth adaptations. This could be investments in broadband throughout the country, which would allow those in rural and isolated communities, including veterans, to receive equal access to telehealth. Additionally, on April 28th, during his first joint address to Congress, President Biden announced that Vice President Harris will lead a rural broadband initiative that would drastically expand access to broadband. We also propose that the state take a localized approach to expanding community-based mental health programs tailored specifically for veterans. This may include funding for mental health training and wellness-based activities within veteran community organizations, 
funding for veteran transportation to appointments and meetings, and educating veterans on how to use VA telehealth resources. For the welfare state, ultimately the best course of action for this matter is to increase funding and expand programs that are already in place. This includes expanding the housing choice voucher program, increasing funding for section eight, increasing the earned income tax credit and child tax credit, and expanding the eligibility to receive SNAP benefits and deepen the assistance that 1.5 million American veterans received from this program. Next. Lastly, we believe that the funding of VA hospitals and the quality of care provided at such facilities go hand in hand, perhaps even being cyclical. If there isn't enough funding for VA hospitals, the quality of care may not be its best. If the quality of care is poor, there will be less incentive for veterans to use VA medical resources. And if less veterans use VA resources, there will be less incentive for additional funding to be provided to those facilities. To address this, we propose the creation of a VA hospital in Hamilton, New York, as it does not have a facility yet has the most veterans per 1,000 in New York State. It's a bit hard to see, but this image provided by the New York State Health Foundation's report on veterans and health from July 2017 shows five facilities in Western New York, one in Central New York, two in Downstate, and four between New York City and Long Island. Now, given the population density of veterans and the lack of a VA hospital in Northern New York, we felt Hamilton County would be the best fit for a new facility, especially since it would be centrally located in that part of the state. Next. I believe we're having some technical difficulties. I think our member got um, kicked who was presenting on this part. Oh, Michelle is not in the meeting right now. Not from what I'm seeing. I uh, apologize for the uh, slight hiccup we have here. Adriana, are you uh, able to give this part of the presentation until we can get Michelle back on the line? Yes, sure, I can continue. She's on right now. Oh, great, she's back. Okay, go ahead, Michelle. Okay. Sorry, um, my wife, I got up. Anyways, um, so when discussing veteran suicide, understanding the mental health conditions that veterans often suffer from is critical when examining possible preventative measures. Through our research, we found, we just, uh, regarding mental health as well as homelessness and addiction. This led us to recommend policies that are meant to address mental health stigma, access to care, and provide alternative forms of care. Next. When examining mental health, we found that conditions such as PTSD and MST have shown to contribute largely to veteran suicide rates. Regarding PTSD, in a survey conducted in 2014, it was reported that 24% of military personnel that had been diagnosed with PTSD had experienced suicidal thinking within the past year. Regarding MST, according to disabled American veterans, survivors of MST show a higher lifetime rate of PTSD for both men and women, men being 65% and women being 49.5%. According to the Department of Veterans Affairs, male MST survivors are 70% more likely to commit suicide as opposed to a veteran without a history of MST. The graph to the left highlights these concerns as it represents the suicide rates of veteran VHA users diagnosed with mental health or substance use disorder per 100,000. Regarding our policy recommendations, based on these findings, the first policy recommendation is targeted at finding a way to address the stigma within the military culture about receiving mental health care. Although Bill S-1788 in the New York State Senate establishes a task force to research mental health and determine how to improve services and suicide prevention for veterans, it doesn't address the concerns of mental health stigma within the military culture. The mindset that seeking help could affect service members carries into their readjustment into normal civilian life. This is important because even if there were improved services, if the target audience of these services is unwilling to seek help due to that stigma, they will still not be as effective as needed. The second recommendation is aimed at establishing more peer-to-peer -peer support for veterans. Although, Bill, although Senate Bill S-666 establishes a help and crisis telephone line for veterans, it is only said to include volunteers who have been trained in veterans affairs. It doesn't offer any peer-to-peer -peer support that is vital due to the experience and understanding veterans will be able to offer one another. This is also important due to the previously mentioned stigma within the military culture, as peer-to-peer -peer support can act as a way to normalize receiving mental health care. Next. 
Although understanding mental health conditions is important, another element to consider is environmental factors that may strain previously diagnosed mental health conditions or cultivate an environment to foster mental health related conditions. One condition we looked at was homelessness. In January of 2019, a point in time survey reported that the numbers of homeless veterans in the state of New York was 1,270. The US Department of Veterans Affairs has reported that veterans who have experienced homelessness are nearly four times as likely as other veterans to have attempted suicide. Also in a study done in 2018, it was shown that largely 48 to 67% of homeless veterans have a mental disorder. Based on this, we wanted to recommend the mobile health care unit. Since the homeless population is usually isolated, providing community outreach to specifically help homeless veterans would allow for more to receive regular care. A version of these units has been implemented within New York City through the Community Healthcare Network. Their fleet of mobile health vans operates within areas that do not have readily available access to healthcare services. They travel to schools and community organizations in boroughs including Manhattan, Queens, the Bronx, and Brooklyn. On Long Island, Stony Brook Medicine operates, a mobile, health, operates mobile health services, but only for specific needs. They operate a mobile stroke unit and a mobile oral health services clinic. Although these examples focus on specializing in one form of care, they serve as an example of how versatile these healthcare units can be. Next. The other condition we examined was addiction. 63% diagnosed with substance use disorder also met the criteria for PTSD. And among veterans with recent VHA use who died by suicide in 2018, 59.6% had a mental health or substance use disorder diagnosis in 2017 or 2018. Based on this, we wanted to recommend the hub and spoke model. Within the hub and spoke model, the hubs act as main medical facilities and the spokes are offshoots designated to handle more specific matters, one area being drug addiction. The implementation of this model would lower the wait time for veterans at larger and often busier hospitals by providing additional areas for specific treatments. Another benefit is that these centers can act as an opportunity for intersectional care. For example, a veteran dealing with substance use disorder will also be able to be treated for any other existing conditions such as PTSD or medical conditions. And lastly, it would also provide veterans with more options as only 60% nationwide utilize VA resources. Next. My team wanted to look specifically at women veterans to determine contributing factors to the disproportionate suicide rate in comparison to women in the civilian population. Women veterans commit suicide 2.1 times more than the civilian women at 15.9 per 100,000 for women veterans and 6.2 per 100,000 for civilian women, as demonstrated by the graph on the left. While looking into the disproportionate suicide rates, we determined that military sexual trauma, or MST, is a significant factor contributing to the suicide rate for women veterans. Next. MST affects one in three women veterans, a huge proportion of the women veteran population. In studies conducted, MST has been shown to significantly increase the likelihood of committing suicide in women as it affects their physical health, such as problems with alcohol, their mental health, such as depression, as well as their military careers. As previously mentioned, MST has been directly linked to PTSD, uh, and significantly increasing the risk of cancer, or suicide, I apologize. MST related PTSD can cause a forced medical retirement from the armed forces, ending the careers of women service members, while the perpetrators of MST continue their careers. In a study conducted, premature separation from the military directly correlates with an increased suicide risk. Next. Women are the fastest growing demographic in the military, making up 20% of all new military recruits. So resources for women veterans need to grow as well. Our team has come up with several policy recommendations to address the needs of women veterans. We need to get women more involved in the VA and VA resources. Women who don't use VA resources have seen a 98% increase in suicide rate. Our first policy recommendation is to require the VA to have gendered programs in all facilities. Currently, not all VA facilities have programs that are gendered and women only resources are not in every facility. In addition to that, there can also be separate entrances for men and women for the VA. Furthermore, we can encourage VA facilities to hire more women faculty members. Currently, only 17% of women veterans use VA services. We need to make sure women feel just as comfortable using the VA as men. Our policies are to make the VA a more welcoming environment for women veterans. Our second policy recommendation is to amend Senate Bill S-666 
originally introduced by Senator James Sanders Jr. with two additional amendments. The first amendment would be to add an additional crisis line specifically for women veterans. The second amendment would add an additional crisis line for women MST survivors. Women who have dealt with sexual assault are more likely to not be comfortable talking to men about their sexual trauma. A, sub a separate crisis line for women MST survivors would provide a lifeline for women at high risk of suicide due to MST. The third recommendation is the expansion of the Dwyer Project's peer-to-peer -peer support program. Currently, there is only one peer-to-peer -peer support program in the state of New York for women, currently based in Buffalo, New York. The Dwyer Project's women's support programs have seen a massive success with more than 1,700 women veterans being partnered with nonprofits. There needs to be more peer-to-peer -peer program for women in New York. We can accomplish this by training and licensing women to start support services like counseling groups and peer-to-peer -peer services. It will be support services operated by women for women. The fourth policy recommendation is to pass Senate Bill 701A, introduced by Senator Anna Kaplan, which establishes a Women Veteran Advisory Committee. This would help women veterans by giving them a voice to advocate for their needs and recommend further policies that would address needs unique to their experience in the future. The amount of women veterans continues to grow every year, even while the overall veteran population declines. Women are becoming an increasing demographic in the military in terms of overall count, but also a percentage of veterans. As the future is, of veterans is increasingly going to have more women, we need to make sure that the resources are also becoming increasingly more aimed towards the inclusion of women to, feet, to fit uni needs unique to their experience in the military. Next. Overall, there are positive results associated with the public health and quality of life approach to suicide prevention. So much so that the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention was developed by the Department of Veterans Affairs. As you can see on the slide, veteran suicide cannot be addressed through one sector. Addressing this topic requires a holistic quality of care emphasis to decrease the daily stressors a veteran may experience. This strategy identifies a multitude of approaches that will best contribute to suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. First, we need to create an environment that leads to healthy and empowered veterans, families, and communities. This can include better access to social welfare programs, education, and better resource and treatment of women, the LGBTQ, and immigrant veteran populations. One great one example of this is the Alex R. Jimenez Military Immigrant Family Legacy Program. This program assists veterans and their families in receiving citizenship during or after military service. This is one instance of a program that can better support the families of veterans, but more support groups and policies are needed to fill the holes in the current literature. Second are clinical and community preventative services. This includes supporting and expanding programs like Veteran Choice, Telehealth, the Hub and Spoke model as mentioned earlier in this presentation, and expanding the Dwyer program, especially in terms of female veteran services. Also, we can expand other female veteran programs like developing separate entrances to developed female veteran clinics in VA hospitals. Senate Bill 1168, which has recently been passed, establishes clinical staffing committees in each general hospital to develop and oversee a clin clinical staffing plan. This is a great program that can track the quality of care and staffing quotas in hospitals. And even though this bill was created for civilian hospitals, the same structure can be applied to veterans hospitals, especially in terms of ensuring there is equal female staffing to support women veterans. Similarly, Senate Bill 1788, which will be voted on the Senate floor soon, creates a Veterans Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Task Force to examine, evaluate, and determine how to improve mental health and suicide prevention resources for our veterans. This presentation has exemplified all of the re reasons a task force like this is necessary to track and implement new bills, initiatives, and even executive orders that could better support veterans. Third is treatment, recovery, and support services. This can include more and expanded mental and physical health screenings for veterans, mobile health centers or clinics for homeless veterans, and things like what are proposed in Assembly Bill 1804, which requires the Veteran Health Care Information Program to provide information concerning health issues related to veterans' children, and also requires the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision to maintain records regarding the military background of certain individuals under its jurisdiction. Specifically, this bill is targeting sectors of the veteran community who may have been left out of the current infrastructure and research. 
Lastly, surveillance research and evaluation, which could take the form of improving the transition process for veterans, including veterans who do not use VA services and more suicide statistics, implementing quarterly mental health checks for all people associated with the military from ROTC, military academies, active duty and veterans, which could be also implemented through AI self-tracking technology and even expanding resources for other than honorable veterans. Moving forward, there should be a multidisciplinary approach to veteran suicide, and it must become an inherent part of our society to see that everyone has a role to play in suicide prevention. Suicide has been shown through this presentation to be the byproduct of a much larger issue in the current veteran resource infrastructure, which can be resolved through intersectional and creative policy making. This now concludes our presentation. Thank you all for having us here today, and we will be taking questions. Thank you, Adriana, um, and the entire team, uh, very informative. Um, I know there's been a few questions already submitted in the chat. Uh, uh, Colonel, uh, did you want to uh, voice your questions? Colonel Goldenberg? All right. Um, we can get to those in a sec. Does anyone else have any questions that they would like to uh, start in with currently? Kirby. You're on mute, sir. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I was wondering if, if you folks had had a chance to look at uh, S4423, the Parker bill dealing with peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, which actually focuses on uh, not only uh, Dwyer uh, accreditation and uh, training, uh, uh, but also for women veteran forums uh, for peer to for enhancement of peer to peer uh, uh, activities within women veterans uh, organizations. Is this a bill that has recently been passed or is currently in the legislature? I personally have not viewed that one specifically, but in the research, I did find resources in New York and different um, committees that were working on something of that matter. Um, and I would say we definitely um, would agree that that form of licensing is necessary. Well, uh, let, me, let me just explain to you briefly, because I think it's something that you really should look at, because I'm very impressed with the research that you've all done, particularly in terms of enhancing the Dwyer program to favor women veterans, uh, not, not to favor them, let me say that differently, to, to create a separate focus for women veterans. Uh, but having said that, uh, that's what S4423 uh, is all about. It's Senator Parker, uh, and uh, we're working hard to get... Uh, the assembly to pick the bill up. Um, and it's one that uh, gets right to the heart of what you're trying to do with Dwyer. Uh, so I'd strongly recommend you take a peek at it, uh, Adriana. If I could just uh, jump in really quickly, I actually just looked up the bill. I saw that it is sitting in committee, like you said, and looked into the details of it a little bit. Um, we do intend on expanding our research after this presentation, and I absolutely believe that this bill could be a focus of one of the topics that we look into, because I 100% agree that everything that the bill uh, discusses encompasses what we are attempting to do with peer-to-peer -peer programs and women's veteran health. Great. Thank you, Amanda. And to contribute to Amanda's response, part of the reason we did want to include some active Senate bills or some that have recently been passed is to re-emphasize the need for these things and the fact that people are actively working to resolve some of these issues, which we felt we needed to highlight. If, if I might, I don't have a question, but I did want to kind of let folks know about a program called ETS. Uh, this expiration term of service uh, uh, sponsorship program. It is a, it, it's a program that really deals with uh, the transition from military to, to civilian life. And, it, uh, and it's focused on suicide prevention. The reason I'm mentioning it is that the idea is that individual areas develop a group of sponsors who are trained and before a service member is discharged, they can volunteer for this program. Once they volunteer, this sponsor who is in the home community connects with that individual prior to discharge and stays in, in contact with them for a year afterwards. 
with the whole idea of really providing support in that transition. And the reason I mention it, it was developed in New York City, but it's currently being uh, developed and rolled out nationally. And um, we are on Staten Island, I'm a CIC or a Community Integration uh, Coordinator for Staten Island. I'm just mentioning it because it's a tremendous program and really anyone across the country, any community can participate. So just kind of throwing it out there. All right, thank you. Um, definitely something worth looking into. Do we have anyone else that would like to chime in with a, a thought, an idea, a question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. I was hoping you. Um, I, I was taking notes. I, I noticed that you kept emphasizing that the suicide rate is between 18 to 34. However, we told you kind of totally forgot the Vietnam era veterans, okay? Because of the simple fact that um, most of our veterans in Vietnam was rejected. So they were not given the opportunity to go to the VA. They weren't given the opportunity to have the services that are created now. You understand what I'm saying? So all these services that are created in the neighborhoods are created in the community in the VA wasn't there 50 years ago. Let's be honest, they were not there. So a lot of our veterans are suffering and, and they're getting older, no disrespect. Um, so they're getting older and now they're becoming empty nests. And with them being empty nests, they have no, um, no self-worth of what to do next. You know what I'm saying? So they become more homeless. They become um, drinking, going back to the drugs. They go, you know what I'm saying? They become more suicidal because they don't know what to do with their lives. I understand that your research is um, focus on the 18 to 34, but let's not forget those that are like 50, 45 and 50 and older. You, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying because you got to understand, um, you talked about women veterans and why they don't um, come out more is because they have a responsibility when they come home. You know what I'm saying? Unlike men, they can go back to their jobs and they're good and fine. Most women, they left their children behind. You know what I'm saying? So when they come home, they don't have time to think about the VA. They don't have time to think about mental health. They got to go back and feed their children. They have to go back and take care of their children where they stop at. So where does mental health come in when you're providing for your family and trying to take and trying to pick up the pieces where you dropped it off at? So this is why there's less women coming to the VA. So we need to address not only mental health in women, but also what are their barriers that's holding them from coming and saying, look, I'm a veteran, I need help. And whether you need help or not, here are the services just in case, not only for you, but also for your family because suicide affects the whole family. It does not only affect the individual, it affects the whole family. I've been there, I've done that, and I've had it on my own self. I know this, okay? So if you want to address women per se understand the social dynamics of the woman itself and what's holding her behind from getting those services also mm -hmm. i realized in, even in my own va hospital there seems to be a gender problem and the reason why i say that is because i can go in and register for myself and i always nine out of ten times always have either a female or a male doctor say are you here for your husband? Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So we need to stop referring women as being a spouse or being another person. If that woman is in that hospital for herself, let's say, ma'am, sir, how can I help you? Not are you here for someone else? Because I tell you right now, that, that stigma or that attitude will make me never go back to the VA again. Seriously. Absolutely. And so, I would... 
Sorry, mm -hmm. if, if I could respond. I mm -hmm. would like to add that we do have about a 60 page report of background research that came from this and our research definitely did not focus only on the 18 to 34 age group. We absolutely recognize that specifically in New York, the um, older age group of veterans is the largest number currently, but we did recognize based on the research and the resources we found in the Dwyer program, etc, that a lot of the research resources did seem to be tailored pretty substantially, and I'm in no way indicating they don't need improvement towards the older population. And it did, and based on some of the academic journals we were reading, there was an indication that yes, female and the younger veteran population don't feel like they belong in the veteran category because that category has typically been associated with older veteran women, um, which is why we did feel the need to emphasize that operating off of the underlying assumption that most people recognize that veterans are in the older age group. Um, and in our report, we do expand more and most of the policy recommendations that we did provide are also things that are 100% applicable to the older generation. Um, I would definitely say that the basis of all of this research is just expanding accessibility, which is also why we emphasize things like telehealth that can obviously help um, not only women veterans, who may be busy and not have the time to access VA hospitals, but also older veterans that maybe do not have a form of transportation to physically access VA resources or hospitals. And I would also like to add, I completely agree with everything you mentioned with um, female veterans and specifically in the literature review in our report, um, there is a study discussed that was conducted with 35 women veterans about premature separation from the military and all of the factors that contribute to that, um, some of which ranging from racism, MST, family requirements, etc. And that is absolutely something we do address. Um, however, I must say, based on time limitations, um, we obviously were not able to include every detail of our report, but um, hopefully that report will be provided to all of you so you can see the more comprehensive and expansive research we did conduct. And if I missed any aspect of your question, I definitely would like to respond. No, um, but let, let me, before I end this, my, my last question would be then, where do we start? Do we start in the community or do we start in the VA or do we start among ourselves? Because this is a lot to kind of take in. Mm -hmm. So I think that everybody, whether you're on a committee, whether you're part of the VA or whatever, everybody has a part, but the problem, the problem is, is who has what part to play? You understand? We all don't want to do everything, but we want to do something. So where do we start? Absolutely. I mean, I would, I mean, every other people are more than welcome to add on to this, but I recognize the fact that VA hospitals are federally regulated. And to some extent, there is only so much a state can do, um, which is why I was kind of looking at the Dwyer program and educational institutions as um infrastructure or platforms that the state does have control and regulation over. And maybe initially some of these programs and policy recommendations can be piloted with state ran programs. And hopefully if they are successful, they could eventually make it up to the ladder to Congress and hopefully national regulation. And if anybody else who would like to expand on that, please do. <laughs> yeah, there is one thing that I did want to add on, um, especially um, Linda, thank you for your comments, by the way, and especially about women veterans and how they have to deal with unique issues such as their children. Um, and so that's specifically why I um, really want to emphasize the Senate Bill 701A by Anna Kaplan to very much so be the voice for further policy recommendations, such as who knows, maybe things like maybe women need a daycare in the VA for when they're seeing services, um, a more inclusive language, specifically on forums and others. So I do think that would be the first step towards a much, much needed um, improvement to the inclusion of women, especially women of color, as we see in the, um, in the research, that black women serve at huge numbers in comparison to every other um, minority. And so I do wanna make sure that that is the, the first step in addressing our inclusion for women veterans. Uh, just, just for the record, if I can add, um, Linda and I started six years ago on, on the bill that I mentioned, uh, Amanda, uh, S4423, 
uh, and it, we have been joined by Marlene Roll in our pursuit of that bill, uh, which is the peer-to-peer -peer bill. And, uh, and it has the full support and is on the New York State Council of Veterans Organizations legislative agenda. There's another bill that we're working on that's a part and parcel to your program, uh, which we, we, we're calling it a veterans assistance locator uh, bill, but, uh, and there's no number on it yet because we've been working with Senator Brooks, of course, and uh, Assemblyman Cusick and uh, uh, Assemblywoman Jean-Pierre uh, to try to figure out a way and I noticed uh, Colonel Goldberg had some comments about privacy issues in terms of trying to um, redirect information of, uh, regarding a veteran to local uh, county, for example, and local assistance programs. And there's uh, Why Why Six Veteran. It's a, it's a website down in uh, in the Hudson Valley area. It's a perfect example of probably two dozen programs uh, that uh, can create assistance for veterans, but making the connectivity is what we find impossible or very difficult. And you've already noted that in your research. What I'm suggesting is that there are ways with the veterans permission to be able to transmit information, particularly as they face, uh, a, a, as they deal with a facing agency. So there may be a way around privacy laws and I would, uh, uh, Adriana, I noticed that you uh, uh, you seem keen on uh, kind of following up with additional research. And this is something that I think presents an incredible problem and an incredible gap in terms of, uh, uh, of making the programs that can actually be at uh, equine, uh, equine uh, uh, therapy, whatever it might be, um, th they're out there. And, and matching the right program with the right vet, be it a woman vet or, or a man, whatever age group, they're out there, but making the connectivity becomes very difficult because you already noted the veteran doesn't want to identify himself or herself necessarily. And so that's something that, that where outreach comes in and somehow or another, I think that gap has got to be uh, connected in terms of locating the veteran and saying, hey, uh, we've got uh, a program that I think might help you uh, and make these programs uh, more readily available and understandable uh, and, and getting the Division of Veteran Services involved. Thank you very much for listening to this long-winded uh, <laughs> dissertation. But, but the bottom line is uh, we, 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 we're not using the resources we have which I think is something that you've already identified. Um, I just yeah. want to say thank you uh, very much for uh, referring back to that bill as well. To start, I would love to be able to speak to you and Linda outside of this presentation more about that bill. Um, as I mentioned, Adriana and I are going to be doing additional research and I really want this bill to have a huge part of that. Um, so if possible, um, anyone's email address or I can provide my own, I would love to speak to both of you about this. Um, with regard, to what Colonel Goldenberg mentioned with the privacy. I actually did look into that right after. Um, and it has to do with the military command exception um, and uh, kind of a subsection of HIPAA under military requirements. And there are certain instances where this personal health in health information can be provided to a commander if certain requirements are met, that being if there is a life-threatening situation to the self, others, or the mission. Um, and I wanted to emphasize as well that the mental health screening that we propose is not something that is going to be shared amongst everyone. That is still separate, you know, um, private between the individual and the professional that they speak to. It'd be the same as any you know, screening would be now. Um, it's simply that, and this goes back to the discussion I had with ROTC students from my university, was that there's this idea of mental toughness and mental weakness in the military. And it is very common, especially amongst men, to not really want 
to accept that there are mental conditions that may need to be addressed. And there might be a lack of a desire to get those uh, conditions addressed at all. Whereas women tend to be more likely to be open about these conditions. And I think to start, as Michelle mentioned, is addressing the stigma. That is the biggest aspect of what we have to do is simply address the stigma and introduce more of these peer programs so that there's a developed community of veterans who can come together and say, listen, we have gone through similar situations. We can connect with each other on multiple levels levels, whether it be, you know, through our similar genders, races, experiences in the military, and speak about those issues so that there isn't a feeling of loneliness and there isn't a feeling of isolation, because that tends to dissuade people from getting that help. And if we establish these peer-to-peer -peer programs, wherever they may be in the state and throughout the country, that's more incentive for military personnel at all levels, whether it be active duty or retired, to reach out and to understand that there is a community of individuals who are there for each other in support. And it's not simply just, we're gonna throw you into a medical facility to address this issue. It's here's a collective of individuals who want to speak to you, who want to understand you and are going to work closely with you to make sure that your needs, whatever they may be, are met in the way that is most comfortable for you. Yeah, and I would also like to add to you specifically um, to the bill you mentioned about the transition process that is being worked on. Um, I imagine that there definitely could be a consent form that is completed by a veteran that would allow whatever VA hospital in their nearest location um, to access their information and subscribe them potentially to VA alerts. And I know specifically, if you all are familiar with the physical evaluation board liaison officer or PEBLO, that is actually what my mother does. She works with veterans who are currently exiting the military and speaking with her and a veteran office service officer she works with in the area. It seems very within reach to provide some form of a consent form or intake form because there is communication that takes place with um, veterans leaving the military, especially if they have a medical or physical disability, they're trying to get rated through that process. There is communication between all of those sectors. So I think it may be more simple than initially thought to connect everyone who's already working together in those different processes. Yeah, I think I think that uh, that um, you're focusing on the VA and, and the mental health issue, which is incredibly important. Uh, it, it, it actually goes uh, to another level through the Division of Veterans Services. And, um, and that's what I was trying to describe with our so-called Veterans Assistant Locator Project in, in terms of making uh, programs available. Um, it, it's, I believe it's, and I was just looking for that desperately and I can't find the section of law right now, but I, I think it's uh, 453 of New York's executive law. But if, if uh, Amanda, if somebody wants to communicate with me uh, uh, on this, uh, I can probably uh, give you the bill that we drafted uh, that Senator Brooks has a, a, you know, a version of, the assembly has a version of it. But I, I think limiting it just to mental health and VA is very important and it's focused. So I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, dismissing it in the least, but also, Every facing agency, whether it's motor vehicle or social services or whatever it might be, they can also get that uh, that so-called veteran's permission. And once the veteran uh, gives permission for something to be in his location, for example, what county he's in, where he's in, whatever, as he faces the Department of Motor Vehicle or whatever it might be, if that veteran um, uh, identifies uh, himself or herself, uh, and, and gives permission, then the county can reach out and bring all of those resources to bear through the county division of veteran services. So, uh, you know, it's, it, uh, it's a situation where you know, getting the horse to water, I think, uh, can, can make a big difference. I did uh, provide my email in the chat um, and I would love to speak to you about this more as soon as possible whenever you have an opportunity to do so. Um, I do wanna address again, just um, 
as Adriana mentioned, there is a 60 page report that we looked into. So there's a lot of information that our team members looked into that for time purposes, we didn't include in this presentation. Um, and we did look into quality of care. And I absolutely agree that there's a lot more than just addressing the issues that has to be looked into. And it is that quality of care and kind of like the flow of the system, so to speak, um, and how it how the process works, how to address the issues before the issues themselves are even addressed. Um, so again, I, I would absolutely Absolutely love to discuss this with you. And then one thing I wanted to add on in particular was you did mention um, kind of like getting the horse to water or getting veterans to their resources. Um, there needs to be, as I mentioned in the uh, presentation, only 17% of women use VA resources. And as we added, there's several factors leading that, but there needs to be a um, concentrated effort to get women to the VA and to use the resources because they desperately need the resources especially in considering their the massive disproportionate suicide rate for women veterans. And um, additionally, if anyone uh, has other comments before we get into that, I did want to address what Colonel Goldenberg mentioned regarding the Elizabethtown Clinic in New York State. Um, I want to first explain, um, and this is definitely not undermining your uh, knowledge on the topic, the difference between the clinics and the hospitals being that the clinics are more for non-emergency matters, whereas I would personally go so far to state that suicide ideation is definitely an emergency and definitely a life-threatening matter, and that's typically handled by hospitals. Um, the Elizabethtown Clinic I looked into, it's essentially on the border of New York and Vermont, and as a clinic, as a general facility, that's incredible to have in northern New York. However, that doesn't address the general, like the larger problems at hand, and especially the more life-threatening conditions that do come along with certain illnesses or certain uh, mental health conditions like anxiety, PTSD, depression, substance abuse, and that's typically handled through hospitals. And with reference back to the hub and spoke model, these are, and as we explained, the hubs are the general facilities. Those would pretty much be the larger hospitals where the spokes would be those offshoots dedicated to certain uh, matters. So I definitely am not, you know, um, you know, saying that the clinic isn't important. I absolutely think any veterans clinic would be extremely important and I encourage more to be created if possible. But uh, the fact of the matter is there needs to be a hospital, a full hospital that can address multiple issues. Um, and having that in an in a area that's very densely packed with veterans seems the most practical. Um, the town itself, as I mentioned, is so much closer to Vermont than it is to central northern New York. And that where Hamilton County is and where we might propose uh, the creation of a new VA hospital would be more centrally located. So it doesn't address, you know, all of the other counties with densely populated areas of veterans, but it does do something for central northern New York. And I think that's something that needed to be addressed. And it's definitely something that we're going to look further into. Absolutely. And I would add to that too, just, just because there are VA hospitals in the state of New York does not mean that all of them are easily accessible. And especially with the older veteran populations, ease of access, whether that's through telehealth or physical location, is definitely a necessary process. And even in relation to women veterans who may not have as much time to access VA hospitals, the closer it is to them, the more likely they probably are to use them. Well, I'm, I'm certainly supportive of, of uh, Hamilton County. I actually know where it is and I've been there. <laughs> we did look into the population density of veterans throughout New York State and the location... I saw yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> the locations of the hospitals where they currently are, it's not to say that they're not in you know good locations, but when you look at how many are so close together in downstate New York, New York City and Long Island, they're very close together when you look at comparatively in Northern New York, where there are not really any available options. And I, um, my father works in healthcare and he actually explained to me that there have been veterans who've said they've had to travel a minimum of an hour just to get to the nearest VA facility, which it, it shouldn't be the case because the distance dissuades people from using those facilities and that goes into quality of care. If they can't even access it, that's another issue. And having you know centrally located facilities is extremely important. It's not to say that those hospitals and those clinics don't do the work they need to do, but when you look into how many other veterans don't have access to those facilities, that contributes to you know, the worsening of the issues at hand. Amanda, the, 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 the gentleman right above you, Bob Becker, actually does uh, 
uh, transportation for veterans here in the Albany, Schenectady, Tri-City area. And nobody knows that logistical issue better than Bob. And you're so right. He, even here in Albany, uh, I sit and I live in Albany or near Albany. I sit in the VA uh, waiting rooms uh, with people that have uh, traveled an hour and a half uh, from as far south as, uh, as almost Westchester County uh, to, to come here to Albany for their treatment. And the same thing going west, uh, uh, quite a ways uh, along the throughway, there's a dearth of, uh, of VA uh, capability. Uh, so, so Hamilton County is certainly a, a logical choice and I, <laughs> I commend you folks for, for finding it. I actually do live in Westchester County. So I, I have a, a little bit of knowledge on how far certain facilities tend to be over in this area. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right, folks. Um, anyone else? Uh, we'll do a last round. I mean, we, this has been a very interesting and impressive presentation, and we've, we're coming up on 90 minutes here. So if there's any last uh, round of questions anyone wants to throw in? All right. Um, I will uh, ask anyone, we will be sending out a copy of the report, obviously, and a link to um, the uh, this video. <clears throat> Uh, anyone uh, that would like that specifically, please enter your email uh, contact information into the chat, but we'll also send out a general uh, email to everyone that uh, we believe was uh, here and invited. So uh, any further questions or, or uh, issues that we want to be addressed on this? We're obviously always looking to continue the conversation. We've got some dedicated and passionate uh, academic researchers here. So um, it's all about, uh, I think there's a strong interest in continuing the conversation if anyone wants to reach out. Well, Joe, I put my email in, uh, hopefully it, it went where it needs to go because I'm pretty new at this, uh, the Senator, the <laughs> uh, I believe Senator we have, we have, we have your contact. Recognize it, but, but, yeah. but anyway, anyway, if you send it to me, I'll make sure that it's distributed within the veterans council to about, uh, 30 some odd uh, members uh, of different service organizations and uh, and Bob Becker is here now as you can see yes and uh, and and Linda McKinnis the vice president so we'll make sure it gets out there okay definitely um as far as the you know it takes us about uh, 24 hours to render the video and put it up on YouTube uh, in a private channel for the senator but we will um so figure you'll receive this in your inboxes somewhere in the next uh, 24 hours or so, so thank you all right um, okay, Senator, you want to take us home? Uh, first, first, I want to thank uh, all of the all of you for your efforts, uh, not just on this report, but uh, on the behalf of veterans. Um, you know, it it is um, it is a group of people that have have given a great service to their country, and uh, there are many. Uh, that are need assistance. I couldn't when the, when the little discussion was going on there about Hamilton County and how far everything is to different places. It is it is a challenge that we have. New York is a big state, number one, and in many areas it's densely populated. Um, and you know, to an extent, and I don't mean I don't mean this in a dollars and cents sense, but it's it's tough for us to expand facilities because of the cost and, and then the ability for people to utilize it. Uh, I, I often think back a number of years ago, I was assisting St. Lawrence County in a risk management project. And I, I just thought out, I didn't know where the devil St. Lawrence County was, to tell you the truth. Uh, and they had a number of problems. And part of it is, is because uh, the there were so many areas in the county as sparse. So I got off, I guess it's the north way to head to uh, the, uh, the county seat. And I was driving and I'm not familiar with the area. And I saw trees and I saw telephone poles. And I saw trees and I saw telephone poles. And after an hour and a half, I called, I was gonna be meeting with the county attorney. I called the county attorney just to make sure uh, I was going the right way because I had at that point driven an hour and a half and not seen another human being. Uh, and, and, and that was, yeah, no, you're headed the right way. And, um, you know, just to, just to put things in perspective, when I got there, one of, the, one of their concerns that they had 
was they would send people out to uh, to help people that that maybe people that were on probation or people that had some mental health difficulties, and and effectively, uh, you don't have a lot of cell service in the county because because of the of the uh, separation. And and one of the things that was one of the first things they hit me with, and I said to Bob, uh, he said we can't communicate with people. I said sure you can. He says, no, John, there's no cell phone service. I says, but you got all the sheriffs downstairs with 800 radios. You can, you can hit California. And then within, within two hours, they had distributed uh, 800 radios to, to the people that were going out because you can do that. But my point is, is uh, that we do have many challenges when we look at the veterans. In, in some cases, we have a density and, and we look on Long Island in particular, where where Suffolk County has the most veterans in the in, in the state located, we have the the facility at uh, at Stony Brook, and and then we've got the Northport also, and going to the city, we have a facility. But it is hard to pick the right locations, and and if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes it's hard to get money in the budget for veterans. We know that we go through the same exercise every year. We the funds we had for Dwyer or any other program get cut and we go running around trying to get everything to be put back. And sometimes some things don't get put back because it's shelved all different places in the budget. So I, so I think um, a, a lot of, of what was said here that way is real. We, we've got to look at, at some things. The fact that, that the attention is there and the fact that all of you on this Zoom right now, all of you, uh, have the dedication and commitment to helping our veterans. Uh, Kirby and, and his, his folks, they work damn hard for the veterans. And, uh, and if you miss some money in the budget, he lets you know you missed it too. Um, and, you know, we've, we've got to continue to expand this program and, and recognize, I think in particular, um, a separation from service needs to get the attention that it needs to get. It is something something ha somebody has to prepare for. It is something where a person needs to understand different options that, that are out there for me, educational assistance in different programs, job searches. Uh, one of the things I, I, I wanna see greater effort made is, is that your military background can be converted easily into a, uh, a document for a college that takes the different things you did and, and associates them to educational programs and, and assigns credits for what your experience is. And, and you know, when a, when a veteran starts for his degree uh, and, and maybe he was in the service for four years just to pick a number, uh, he, he picks up maybe 1,800 or more credits and 1,800. 18 or more credits coming in the door that makes that, that task easier for him. And, it, and it's not that he's being given a free free bonus. He has the experience that he should be get, giving the credit to, but makes it easier for him to achieve that objective and go on. So, uh, you know, we, we have a lot more work to do in the veterans. Uh, this report will be distributed to everybody on the veterans committees and others to, for people to look at. Um, and, and there's a lot of good discussion points there. And one of the things we are always looking at is, is the concentration of programs in different areas in the state. Some of it is a direct result of the people in the community showing the interest in the veterans and becoming the driving force to getting those programs. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's some places, and if we use just picking on St. Lawrence County for no reason other than I, I brought them up, the fact that they are so sparsely populated in there is, you know, it's a day trip to, uh, to get to a facility, and, and that's tough for people. But, but I think um, we'll all have ac access to this report shortly to take a look at it. I think we, we want to continue these efforts. And, um, and most importantly, for the, the folks that worked on the project, um, you know, you had an opportunity to open the door on an area that, and I think, I think very 
very uh, accurately, you pointed out 9-11 has a lot to do with with the kick point for certain things because uh, the day itself was a horror show, as, as every one of us know. And the situations that, that people were in, um, you, you know, when you, when you look back um, to when I was younger, uh, war was something so many people didn't experience other than those that were in the military on a firsthand basis. But the Vietnam War was brought into the living room and everybody got to see war at, at the supper table almost. And for 9-11, that was a, we lived that live. And things you couldn't imagine was happening in front of you. And for some people, that brought back other experiences that they had in different areas. So I think this this a great effort on your people, and, and we have a chance to read it and absorb it and see where we take things. Um, I, I thought uniquely some of the folks uh, were asking some questions about whether you saw a piece of legislation or, or are from there uh, aware of uh, different areas. And, Kirby, Kirby had a, ge a geography test on where Hamilton County is, uh, that, that, that we look at that, but um, we're, we're looking, everybody's looking, that's important. And um, the fact that we have younger people and older people, uh, older people, people with, with uh, military experience all discussing this important issue and recognizing too, that the military is changing, um, the the women or females or however uh, are playing a bigger and bigger role in in uh, in the military. Uh, sometimes when they need assistance, they'd like to speak to a, a a fellow woman as opposed to always a guy. And we we need to get peer people that want to do that. I think. Um, and part of what you underscore is the peer-to-peer -peer programs are exceptionally effective because you're talking to somebody that walked where you walked. And, and you, you don't have to try to give them a background or her a background on what it's like because they know. And I think that's such, uh, such an important tool. And, and I think, too, as we look at the experience, one of the things I've always thought about it, and I'm, I'm guilty of it myself, and, and are you a veteran? And uh, for the longest time, I, I, I said, no, I wasn't a veteran. I was in the National Guard, because to me, um, I didn't go to combat. So while I, while I did what I was supposed to do, if you will, and I went through the training as a medic, um, I didn't think I was good enough to claim to be a veteran. Um, because there were other people that uh, were in a combat zone. I wasn't, and I actually could never go into one because of my color blindness. I, I couldn't see anything. But, um, and then other people uh, don't say that I was a veteran, and, and part of it is the problem we had in Vietnam where uh, we, we gave people a, not, not the OTH, um, and, and that was like a mark and it meant something and just stay away from that. Uh, so um, we, we, we have not always traveled the road correctly. And um, I think we, we, got, we got a lot more to do. Uh, I worry a lot right now with our Vietnam veterans in particular that uh, many of them are showing some health related problems as associated with agent on and, and the rest and we've got to look at that and and you think of the difficulty that um, our reservists in particular have today because one day you're working on a walking down a street in your community and maybe the next day you're in a in a hot zone of some type and and it's pretty hard to flip a switch back and forth the one minute you can accept everything in a peaceful community and the next minute you're making sure you're not driving down the wrong street where there's a bomb or coming around a corner where somebody's about to do something. So uh, there's a lot of stress with people that are in the military. And, and when you 
when one day the left shoe is in a in a combat situation and the next day it's uh you know at the beach it's pretty hard but i appreciate the effort everybody took to put into this number one and i uh, appreciate the folks uh Kirby and the others that, that, that have taken the time to look at that and, and more importantly, I appreciate the incredible efforts they make on the part of the veterans in this state. I, I, I don't think people get to see how much they, they're doing all the time and how much they're working on legislation. I, I, I would say to you, um, as I look at what we've done in the Veterans Committee the last few years, uh, we've been much more active than in the past in working on legislation and trying to get it, it put through because that committee, the people that are on that committee, doesn't matter the party they're from, we drop the party at the door. And we're a bunch of people trying to help those who've served and trying to solve problems. Um, and it's sometimes it's, it's really difficult to get the money that we need uh, and the attention and, and um, you know, we got to keep working on that. So we're going to get these reports to everybody and, and we'll be, I'm sure there'll be some follow-up uh, activity on this and other things, but, but I want to thank all of you for the work that you've done and, and for the, the folks on the, on the council. Um, I don't know how we thank you for what you're doing because you guys are at it 24 hours a day. Uh, trying to do the right things, and and then the one the one thing, if I could accomplish anything up there right now, it would be to stop the damn cuts every year in the budget where we waste a month and a half trying to put money back that should have been in there, and without question, and move on to the next thing. But that's stuff we just have to work on. That's that's where we are. But I thank everybody for for. Um, gone through this and and the exchange that we had and and I think um, you know uh, we need to continue to create and refine legislation to help people and and we're going to get a big ribbon and put it in Hamilton New York so the whole state knows where it is we don't, <laughs> we don't have a problem but thank you all very very much for what you did and uh, for the folks that participated in this intern program, thank you very much for the commitment you made. You guys, you guys worked hard, uh, and um, you know, in doing a report, and people don't have to agree with everything that's in it or every suggestion that's made, but it's it's a different generation taking a view of a problem that we're working at and giving input, which I think is important. And uh, as you research stuff, and, and we don't know the, the turns in the world and what happens, you know, we go from a peaceful time to unfortunately a time of war. We don't know when, when the coin is gonna flip a different way. Not that I'm saying there's gonna be a war tomorrow. I don't mean that. Um, but uh, I thank you for your efforts and I thank you for your insight and your recommendations to, to where we are. And to those in the council, I thank them for, for most of them, their service to this country and their service to our veterans and their solid, solid commitment to making sure that as a state, as a nation, we do right by our veterans and we still have a ways to go there. So thank you all very, very, very much. Thank you, Senator. Um, and thank you again, everybody who participated today. Um, uh, Kirby, 